Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. All right, it's time once again for Music Night the Majestic. And with us again, Johnny Cola. Johnny, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back, Michael. I'll tell you, when you were on before, we had a lot of viewer questions uh, that we didn't get to in that one. But after parts one and two posted, we had even more questions for you. So, uh, tell you what, why don't we just tear right into them? You bet. And uh, <clears throat> first question is from Annette in South Carolina. And she wants to know, what was your working relationship like with Huey? Well, there's a broad stroke, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with one uh, of the easy ones, Johnny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, what particular night or day, you know? <laughs> you, know uh, you know, we were, we were uh, I'd say, uh, we were very like-minded in the fact that we looked at the big picture, making records and uh, stage uh, uh, um, ideas and segs for songs and all of that stuff. Uh, rather than uh, thinking about ourselves. Um, and I, I, I suppose it's, that's not always easy to do uh, in a band. You know, you wanna, you wanna do the me, as a lot of folks say. And uh, I think we both had a knack of that, both uh, in the recording studio and, and uh, live performances. Had that in yeah. common. Was it a situation where you guys thought enough alike, but different enough to where it wasn't just a mutual admiration society, but you get, you know, pushed each other to, to up the game, if, if you will. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, and uh, both of us, and, and I should include other band members, uh, uh, drummer Bill in particular, um, it's that that's when it becomes sort of a, more by committee. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, as soon as it's two against one, apparently the idea isn't working. If you know what I mean, uh, we won't <laughs> sit around there and and uh, and and argue over a bad idea. You know, we knew how to get something out on the table and get it off if it wasn't working. So, yeah, always a plus. Yeah, yeah move the ball forward. <laughs> well, that's the key. Yeah. Tell you what, moving on. Chuck in Florida asks, what were some of the records that were most influential on the music that you create? Oh, goodness. Uh, well, I guess that goes back to uh, our previous conversation, you know, uh, and that is uh, I like that blend of R&B and old country rockabilly. Um, I mean, without naming particular artists, that's the blend I like. Um uh, you know, Lucky Devil was uh, pretty straight ahead. Uh, uh, um, not country, Americana is a better term, where um, I hear voices and other voices were definitely on the soul side. I think going forward, I'm going to try to blend those two somehow. And uh, that's that's where my musical passion lies. And I know yeah, who yeah. Chuck is in Florida, too. <laughs> Well, make I sure to tell him you said hello. Yeah, good. <laughs> he, he didn't mention that anytime you want to come down to the beach, the door's always open. Yeah, okay. You can go hang out by his pool. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> All right. Judy in Illinois wants to know, do you prefer small clubs, arenas, or venues somewhere in between? Oh, having just been to a big, big mega rock show at the Chase Center in San Francisco uh, um, to see an a unnamed band. I don't really care if I ever go to an arena rock show again, uh, as I, I think we discussed. It, it's so impersonal and, and uh, um, both for the viewer and the band, as far as I remember, when we were doing those big shows, it's, uh, you don't have that connection. And, you know, give me a good 5,000 seats or less and and, okay, more than 2,000, less than five, and I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, talk about small clubs. Yeah, here's a question for you. All right. Uh, it's, uh, you're at the 2 a.m. club, and you've only got enough cash to play one song on the jukebox that hasn't been played yet. 
Do you choose A, Billy Young's You Left the Water Running, B, The Gladiola's Little Darling, or C, The Tam's What Kind of Fool? Which one do you pick, Johnny? <laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> probably what kind of fool do you think i am because that's uh that's one i i could have cut but uh no i didn't and i just i love that tune well on, on the next record yeah maybe yeah well i hope the next record i hope to cover all johnny cola tunes but we'll see <laughs> well you know the b-side do it to the b-side for a single yeah yeah god i miss yeah. b-sides <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Tell me, tell me this. What was a, did you ever buy a 45 as a kid and then find find that you liked the B side better than the A? Absolutely. And you know, there's been several records where the B side uh, uh, became the hit. Don't mm -hmm. make me name them, but I just, just, what, what was I reading? I'm, I'm reading uh, uh, um, a book on Michael Bloomfield. And uh, uh, that that particular scenario comes up where, you know, some DJ in uh, in Indiana flips it over and the in the and the phones start ringing off the line and the rest is history. You know, I love those stories. Yeah. Well, actually, we have a question about similar along that line, I should say. Sean Dell in Tennessee asks, did the band choose which songs would become singles, the record label, or was it a mutual agreement? That was a, a that's easy. That was a group decision. Generally, we have our ideas and we throw it to, or back in those days, we throw it to the A&R and consult our manager and and uh, um, somehow, the, especially with sports, we would figure out some order. You know, we were just, let's face it, if you're in that situation, you're just happy to have five to pick from, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, two, two, if you have two that are obvious, you're doing good, but five, that's, that's exceptional. So <clears throat> that's how that's done. That was easy. Yeah. T tell, tell me this, Johnny, were there any songs that you were, you know, hoping that everybody would, you would choose to be singles that didn't get selected? I don't think so. No. I, I mean, honestly, if I had my way, and this is not because I had a hand in, in the authorship of these particular songs, but uh, back to the Huey Lewis and the news as a democracy, I probably would have point us, pointed us more toward uh, "Tell Me a Little Lie" and 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 uh, uh, um, you know the the sort of rock and roll rockabilly thing, and we probably would have sold uh, you know one tenth of the records. So <laughs> thanks for the democracy, guys. We did the right thing. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you another uh, question here for you, Johnny. Jeff in Texas asks, is there anything about the band that would surprise people? <laughs> well, Jeff. <laughs> Nothing like putting you on the spot a, there, Johnny. A few, but I'm not going to mention them live on in a, in a podcast. Uh, I don't know that would surprise people. Um, that's a pretty blanket question here. Let's see. Anything in the band that would surprise people? Uh, something simple like, uh, we actually love the bus. A lot of bands come up, they have a few hits, and their biggest aspiration is to be able to take a private jet everywhere. Well, we we absolutely loved the, our bus. Uh, we, we had a couple. And the A bus, for lack of a better term, that carried Huey and Bill and uh, John Pierce and myself and the road manager, we would actually design our our uh, our drives so that the guy, if we had time, the guys could get into town early in the morning to get the golf game in before the show. Hey, I quit golf ten years ago, but uh, I, I rolled with it. You know, <laughs> who had the lowest handicap? Uh. Well, that's a good probably probably Huey. Uh Bill was a close second. Or if you ask them, uh, uh Bill would probably argue that point. I I really don't know. It's between the two of them, <laughs> certainly. And my handicap has always been my swing, so I'm out of that. <laughs> I feel your pain. 
well, <laughs> well ensconced in the mid nineties, you know, and I'm happy. So. <laughs> well, I'll tell you now we got to got a question that pertains to uh, uh, part one when uh, you're telling the Van Morrison story. Bevan, Missouri wants to know, is Van Morrison as cantankerous as his reputation would have you believe? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. You know, you can't fake that stuff, right? Uh, <laughs> um, he, I, I got to say, though, uh, when he hired us, when he hired Soundhole to back him up, he uh, treated us with kid gloves. Uh, and to this day, uh, um, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've always read that he's really shy. Isn't that the case usually when, you know, with models and actors and actresses? A lot of times, it's not that they're stuck up, they're just shy. But I had the, uh, um, I had the honor of actually of introducing Van to Huey backstage uh, at a ranch in Nicasio years and years ago. So I wear that little badge and I introduced Huey to Sly, if I have this correctly, at one of the awards uh, after uh, after parties. And so um, I like that one, too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> speaking of Sly. We have a question about, about Sly. Uh, Sam in Tennessee wants to uh, uh, ask, there's been some, there has to be some wild stories about playing and hanging out with Sly Stone. Can you tell us a couple of them? A couple? Can't just tell one? Yeah, one works. <laughs> well, what I like... Sam will have to be happy yeah. with one story, Johnny. Yeah. Well, let me think of a good one because there were a few not so good ones. Um, did I tell the story when I got hired? Probably did. No, yes. no. Well, I, uh, my my tail was dragging because I didn't have a gig, and we had gotten unceremoniously released from Soundhole. This is probably back in the uh, probably in seventy five or seventy six. I can't remember one of those two years. And the keyboard who was uh, excused from that band at the same time I was got a gig playing with Sly right here in Novato, California. Now I'm living right, I'm living in the same town down the hill. Sly and I had gone to the same junior college, albeit eight or nine years apart, older than me. And uh, I'm just, now my buddy John has a gig with Sly. Now I'm really hurting. Um, and he comes by every day to say hi on his way up. And one day he calls me, he says, Sly wants to meet you. The trumpet player, the sax player uh, just got fired. And he wants to, uh, I told him all about you, where you grew up, same county as him, and he wants to meet you. So I go up there about five or six o'clock, and I leave Sly's uh, house about two in the morning after thousands of stories and people we, uh, mutual acquaintances and people we knew in Solano County. And all he said was, uh, he called me John Cola. He didn't call me John or Johnny. I was John Cola. He said, all right, John Cola, you're hired. I hadn't even played a note. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even brought my horn, you know? So that was kind of cool. Yeah. That was a good story. I, I, I'd, I'd read that he was always suspicious about folks uh, trying to, to either take his music or or what it, what have you. Is, is that uh, accurate? Yeah, I, I think so. There was a certain paranoia there. Uh, absolutely. Um, I don't know. Did I tell those stories? No. That same night. when uh, No, no, no. Sorry. It's the next night or maybe the night after. He called me up. Uh, shoot, I lived right down the hill. I lived two miles away. He called me up to uh, put together all the horn parts for the horn section. And the way to do that was to go through a pile of let me see. What am, what am I doing here? A pile of seven and a half inch reel to reel tapes and go through and try to pick out all the horn parts and chart them for this uh, horn section, you know, the new horn section I'm in. I did that and again ended up leaving about three or four in the morning. I said, I right, man, I got to go. I can't do this any longer. <laughs> Come back tomorrow. No problem. So I'm walking down the stairwell to get out of the plaza. He goes, Thanks, man. Okay, John Cole, take it. He says, Hold on. I said, What? He goes, Turn around. I turned around, 
and he frisks me in the back and the sides. I said, what? And he goes, all right, man, you're clean. So he was worried I was stealing live tapes. Hey, bless his heart. Well, thanks for the memories. I, <laughs> I remember that story. <laughs> so, yeah, there was a lot of that going on. We had another one, a, a second engineer who shall go nameless, but he was quietly rolling two track at um, our sessions at uh, the record plant in Sausalito. And uh, Sly busted him on that and took the tape and destroyed it. And after they uh, had words, he became one of Sly's best friends. So you just <laughs> never know in this world, in this world of rock. <laughs> yep. Oh, too funny. I'll tell you, uh, moving out here, Johnny, Maureen in New Jersey wants to know, which is your favorite, guitar or sax, and why? Oh, I see, because you see me live playing guitar and sax. Uh, well, I'm more proficient at the saxophone, so I kind of have more fun with it. And actually, I took quite a break from everything uh, after Huey lost his hearing to just sort of get my life in order here at the house and uh, and my studios and stuff. And I'm picking up guitar and sax again, working on my stuff again, and falling in love with both of them all over. It's it's kind of fun, you know. Uh, um, I lost a little ground, but I'm picking it up again. Um, if I had a favorite, I uh, on stage, I like, uh, I would say it's guitar because I get to sing. And, uh, and that's, that's a lot of fun. So um that would it would go that way yeah saxophone i like playing sax when i'm back there in the section that just gives me a thrill like no other <laughs> i miss it tell me this lot. who are your big influences on each instrument <laughs> uh, on saxophone none really i never uh, i never really studied the uh, saxophone i never took I took one lesson from a fella uh, there in Nevada way back when, but uh, when I'm on the floor doing deep breathing exercises and he's smoking a joint, I knew this something was not right there. So <laughs> I didn't work with him anymore. Uh, what was the rest of that? <laughs> Sorry. I uh, Talk oh, about, about, about the influences there. Oh, guitar. I have none except I, I'm really attracted to that Americana thing. Uh, 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 I don't know, you know, I, I just like that sort of rough and tumble stuff. Uh, uh, Steph does so well, does it really well. And I learned a lot from him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, one of the I things, that, uh, oh, God, I'm sorry. I said, I just miss those guys. I miss the stage and, and, uh, the camaraderie before the show and all that, but, uh, you know, life goes on. So. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that's one of the things, you know, with the band, where you, all, you know, frequently you hear about a lot of infighting and you know, personality clashes and stuff. You never really heard that about you guys. No, we had a few scuffles. <laughs> <laughs> that's life. Not worth bringing up, but uh, yeah. uh, uh, who knows? They're probably, I'm guessing, maybe it involved alcohol, but I don't know. <laughs> I would be guessing. <laughs> That's never happened. Never. <laughs> now, what I was going to say is one of the, the frequent questions that we got, people wanted to know what tracks of the, the news do you think have held up the best? Well, Power of Love, obviously. Um, uh, well, I'm working with a guy putting a documentary together. And I sat around the studio here and gathered, uh, as I may have mentioned before, I've got pretty much everything Huey in the news right down here by my feet, all the daily cassettes we took home for every record we ever made. So I dug out all the Power of Love stuff and to hear that tune grow and evolve into um, uh, what everybody heard in 1985 was uh, was really cool. It took me back to all the studios. Uh, uh, besides that, um, I know a lot of the fans aren't going to like this, but if this is it and stuck with you, really pop in the radio. And um, for me, um, I'm a bit of a romantic. I know. 
Nobody believes that. <laughs> but I am, and I really like those two tunes. I love the way they translate uh, on the radio. Yeah. Now, we also had people asking which songs, or a couple, if there are a couple, that you thought should have been a single that weren't. Hmm. Wow. We, you see, the problem with the question is most fans are more knowledgeable about Huey and the News than me. Because I'm just, I'm going like this. We're just going through it, you know. And I, I don't look back much to remember this stuff. Yeah. So you tell me, was "Hit Me Like a Hammer" a single? I uh, I believe it was. Uh -oh. Now, see, off, off of yeah, hard at play. As I said, you know, in part two, uh, I thought "Time Ain't Money" should have been a single, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. You know, and uh, uh -huh. you know, a couple of people over the years in, in discussing, you know. Uh, music you know, with friends and what have you a uh, number of people have said that they thought that uh, better be true should have been a single not give me the keys I'll drive you crazy I'll buy that one <laughs> so I didn't even know give me the keys was a single that that record was sort of a, a, um, I don't know we got it done and I moved on to the next thing but <clears throat> now you're jogging me my memory because I think we made a video for it uh, I, uh, yeah, that wasn't one of my favorites. Let's just put it that way. But I like, I like your thinking because I had a hand in writing both of those. <laughs> Can we just take it back in time a little bit and relive it? <laughs> well, well, we'll get a hold of Marty and Doc. We'll hop in the DeLorean. We'll go back, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't convince know everybody. I What's the line from the movie? I didn't even know I said that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all yeah. right tell you what getting back to uh viewer questions johnny mm -hmm. uh, mike in texas wants to know were there any songs that were pitched to you guys that you later regretted passing on hmm. Hmm. um wow we now i'm really going to, yeah actually um and along those rockabilly time ain't money uh, lines, uh, we got a, we were pitched a, a tune called Straight A's in Love from Bob Dylan. And I just loved it. I could, I heard it. I had the concept. I said, let's do it. And I think for some reason, Huey couldn't wear it. So we never cut it, but uh, I'm sorry we didn't, uh, I, we didn't cut that one. Somebody did. Maybe Bob, maybe Bob did. I don't know. But uh, yeah. Uh, I remember getting a cassette. I said, "Holy Toledo! Uh, this is a Bob Dylan tune. You know, maybe we should cut it, even if it's, um, you know, a turd on a shingle, whatever." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I don't know who passed on. I, I think Huey couldn't wear the lyrics, so we moved on. Yeah. Now, see, mm -hmm. there's another one, another B side for you for for the upcoming album. True. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to see who cut it first. And how good yeah. and how well they did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if it's one of those, you go, yeah, we'll just leave well enough alone. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now I'll tell you, uh, a song that you guys did cut, uh, mm. the uh, Heart and Soul. You uh, Exile had done it first. And then you guys cut it. And the arrangement, everything was very close yeah, to it. How did you guys come to, to choose to do uh, Heart and Soul? Well, the Mutt Lang Huey Clover connection. Mutt produced a Clover record, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> when uh, he was up and coming on, on the Mercury label. I, th I think Mutt produced, yeah. And um, so, he, like I said, Huey being the shy, coy type he is, uh, he and Mutt hit it off famously. And when we started, uh, you know, we're on record number two, and and uh, we feel the, the flame under our feet. We needed a hit and Mutt threw us that one. I'd never heard uh, or I didn't know Exile had cut, cut the tune. But at the same time we were cutting the tune, I'm not sure you knew this, there was a band from L.A. called the Bus Boys mm -hmm. who were cutting it at exactly the same time. I don't know the rest of the story, but somehow either ours got out sooner or we had a bigger record machine in back of us and we got the hit and they didn't so 
Yeah. <laughs> well, was it uh, JP Pennington from Exile was on the show a while back, and right. he was you know talking about that because actually a uh, that album uh, of Exiles had uh, a song that Alabama went to number one with that you know wasn't a hit for Exile, and then Heart and Soul you guys had the monster hit with. And you know, JP was saying, you know, we're sitting there kind of going, hey, <laughs> yeah, what was wrong with our record, basically, you know? <laughs> Maybe he should have got me to produce it. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> uh, tell you what, uh, Justin in Illinois, is it true that Huey wasn't supposed to sing on We Are the World, but had to replace someone? Um, I think there's some truth there and i'm going to say i don't know this for a fact but i think uh i think uh, prince was supposed to take that line <clears throat> um that's really all i know i, I yeah. heard a rumor and uh and uh you know huey was just flattered i mean it was <laughs> i mean i can't remember who i told what but uh being the studio rat i am i did everything in my power to make myself invisible in the control booth while all the principals are singing their line in a circle and you know who they are. I don't need to name them. And I just sat back there and hope no one would say, Hey, what's that kid in the corner doing in here? You know, there's only life magazine and Newsweek and, and, uh, and melody maker and a few others stand there with steno pads like the old days. And, and, uh, no one called me to the mat and I sat in there and watched the whole thing. So, yeah, I think I think Huey got chewed in there, which is he knocked it out yeah. of the park. <laughs> yeah, well, I, that's what I I had read was the fact that you know uh, Prince wasn't there to do the line, and you know he, they asked Huey to step up and uh, and do it. So I, think that's I didn't know if it was true or not, though. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right, An Anita in Virginia wants to know how long did it take to film the video for doing it all for my baby, and what do you remember about making it? Uh, let's see. That was with Tower Power, uh, I believe. Yes. Yeah, that that was the uh, the extended, yeah, you know, like the mini movie, the Frankenstein. Movie. Right. How long did it take? Too long. <laughs> Period. That's it, Anita. It took too long. Now, you know, <laughs> once you have to get into costume and character, like act any actor will say with this, when they have to put on too many props. Uh, it's novel for about 10 minutes, you know, with the, the hat and the soot and the cigar. That cigar got pretty old after uh, <laughs> after about 20 minutes. And um, I better preface this whole thing with videos were never my favorite line of work in the music business, but I understood their value. Uh, uh, so uh, there we were, man. We're in the middle of the 80s and we got a great looking affable lead singer and uh and we're making videos doggone it like everyone else so uh, it took i think it was a two-day shoot it's a sound studio somewhere in uh, maybe warner brothers in studio city or something can't remember but uh, i do remember walking out a back door and i propped it open just to get out of the room because it's full of smoke and people and you got to watch where you're walking and and um i sat I propped myself up against the uh, <laughs> the wall on the sidewalk, and folks thought I was a bum, you know, a homeless dude. <laughs> I'm out there all by myself. So finally, somebody walked by and gave me a look. I had the cigar. I said, "Got a light?" <laughs> Didn't even look at me. <laughs> oh, too funny. You got to entertain uh, yourself. Some <laughs> exactly. You got a lot of downtime. Yeah, that's right. All right. Charles in California asks, I know the band was close to the 49ers. How did that come about? And did you actually get to fly with it, uh, with them on the team plane? Uh, how it came about, uh, I think it was as simple as probably singing the anthem and uh, playing. I, they used to wheel a semi out right on the field and you would play at halftime or whatever. It was a pre-show halftime. I can't remember. And a couple of the guys in the band, uh, well, obviously it's the star power, Montana and Dwight Clark and, and uh, you know, Lot and a few of the others uh, took to us. We became their, uh, uh, um, 
their their mass their musical mascots at the time, right? So mm -hmm. that blossomed, and uh, I personally never flew on the uh, team plane. Possibly Huey and Bill did. They're a little more fanatic, fanatical about sports and and the like. Um, but uh, golly, we did a lot of hanging out. Um, we got flown. Uh, Oh, I don't know, all over the place for ring parties. And and uh, as, as everybody knows, we brought uh, four or five of them in to sing uh, <laughs> on a couple tracks, which was uh, just a kick in the pants. Yeah. We brought our fathers so they could meet Joe and Joe's father. And, and they're talking like old friends, you know, World War II and, and the like. It's, it was really cute, really yeah. cool. <laughs> now, now, uh, how much did it take for you to coordinate their vocals? Yeah. And that was a bit of a task, you know. Uh, there's actually some pictures out there online somewhere and folks can see. I don't think, no, we didn't film anything. There was a lot of cameras going off. And it's funny, I think, uh, don't ask me which tune we cut first, but uh, let me see. I know what I like and hip to be square. I think it was hip to be square. and. You know, we got them around them. We got the Mike and Omni. We got these five or six bulls in there. And they're nervous as hell. And I'm sort of the coach of the whole thing. I think we had a couple other guys, uh, uh, our bass player at the time, and and maybe uh, our friend Michael Duke might have been in there to help flesh the thing out. So here we go, you know. You'll hear the track, and you listen to the headphones, and you just, I'll go one, two, three, four. Here there and everywhere and you're off and running right so tapes rolling they go and i give them the signal one two three four here there and everywhere hip hip and they're all looking at each other and laughing and stuff i said okay okay <laughs> here he comes out and we're going you guys you know man up it's got to be big and bold you know let's do one dry so we sing one dry no no harder harder okay that's not working the vending machine had beer in it so hey you guys pop a beer. We're going to try it again in a few minutes. And they, and they eventually nailed it, but it was funny. They were like a bunch of little puppies, you know? It was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, Dwight Clark was actually a pretty good singer. Yeah. It's hip to be square. You can hear him at the end of the tune. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. And actually, it, uh, at a show or two, did he come out and sing with you guys? Oh, yeah. Sure. All the time. Hey, we took DC out on the bus. He was out with us for about a week and wow. did cameos every night. And, you know, we, we, uh, he was one of the boys, man, no doubt. Uh, it was really, it was really cool. And I have such fond memories about those times. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> You're going to make me cry, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll follow it up with this question then, since we're talking about hip to be square. Michael in Kentucky wants to know if you're too hip to be square. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> i gotta be honest you know when that tune came up uh i didn't get it i know a lot of people do and it was great for the career and uh there's a lot of uh um uh, uh, ties and and uh and starch collars that really went crazy over that and i get that you know huey went to private school and and uh you know, we're pretty much all pretty much all smart guys, and and uh, uh, but um, I didn't really take to the title, uh, and only ten or and I voiced my opinion. And he said, "Don't worry, everything's going to be okay. It's hip to be square." I understood what he was talking about, but just it didn't wasn't rock and roll for me. That's all I got to say. And <laughs> so, fifteen years later. Uh, he, what was our what was our questioner's name? Um, uh, Michael in Kentucky. Michael, uh, 15, 20 years later, Huey finally changed the lyric to Too Hip to Be Square. You've never <laughs> heard that on a record. So <laughs> it's not that I was right. It's just it evolved a certain way. So Yeah. <laughs> it did uh, just fine, right? <laughs> yeah, the record <laughs> did OK. <laughs> yeah. Now, actually, that one had another interest. The, the video on that was interesting as well. It wasn't obviously as big and theatrical, but with all with the with the camera work where you had all the close up shots, you know, on uh, 
the mouths and the drums and what have you. That was, that was uh, an interesting uh, visual technique that was used you know, in that. What do they call that? Uh, an arthroscopic camera, I think. And mm -hmm. You don't want to know where those things go, right? <laughs> okay, ears and noses. But that was what it was. It was a little tiny light tube camera. Someone out there right now is saying the name of it, and I don't know it. But these two guys, Godly and Cream, Cream uh, we shot that in the UK. Tower of Power was uh, touring with us, and we just kind of squeezed that in one day or two. And uh, um, they, um, yeah, it was interesting. Actually, I, I can barely remember it, only when you brought it up. But their real claim to fame was the band called 10CC. God exactly. Said that. I'm not in love, so don't forget it. It's just a crazy thing I'm going through. Yeah, well, okay, they didn't Kevin, want me to uh, sing it. Yeah, we heard enough of that one. Let's let's work, <laughs> right? <laughs> Kevin was on the show a, a while back. Oh, you know, yeah. telling the story about about that the how that song came about which is a truly interesting story on it but mm. uh yeah he and lol did some really inventive music video work yeah yeah no kidding they did well it's yeah. a fantastic track too it's a gorgeous mm. song held yeah. up great so uh here on a, on a more you know we'll say serious slash professional note in uh, part one, I believe it was, we talked about uh, Bob Clear Mountain's compliment uh, to, to you guys. Uh, Pete in Wisconsin wants to know, what is your technique in recording vocals that gets the results Bob Clear Mountain is so taken with? <laughs> uh, I think I might have shown you uh, on our last interview, but I don't know. Um, uh, both Huey and myself bought... Uh, Neumann U49s, and uh, right now a couple uh, uh, studio sausages just passed out on the floor to know that I we both own one, <laughs> and uh, that's all I can really say about it. I don't want to get into a specific technique, but uh, they have an amazing presence, and Huey's mic particularly was um, tweaked for his voice, uh, so the. Um, that's his sound, and um, and Bob just likes the way it works. So it's as simple as that. Him. Yeah, it's simple as that, man. <laughs> I'm looking <laughs> at it right now, so I keep looking over there. I, where am I <laughs> it is a, it is a it's a secret weapon in the studio for vocals. Let's face it. You want to use uh, folks? We're going to go technical on you. Want to use a U89? Uh, uh, 87, sorry, for a group vocals and horns and stuff, great. But if you want for a vocal, there's only a few exceptional mics, which I won't bother naming, but U49 is one of them. So. Yeah. That's my trick. <laughs> my trick. <laughs> Do you want me to edit that part out <laughs> so no, yeah. nobody else can uh, you know, <laughs> copy that technique? Well, the good news is, uh, no, not really. The good news is about a 49 is nobody can afford them anymore. So if you want that 49 sound, you got to go rent it somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've just gone through the roof. Yeah. I'll tell you, uh, we had a number of folks that wanted to know if there's any tracks that you guys cut over the years that might be released in the future. I know you, you kind of touched on that in part two a bit. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. Um, I'm not really at liberty to say, but uh, the intention is certainly there. And uh, I think there might be stuff in the vault. <laughs> the vault. The vault is my garage in our <laughs> office. Uh, there might be some stuff. No, there is definitely some stuff the public would be interested in. I think it's just a matter of working on it and presenting it the, the right way. So but who knows? Uh, yeah. Or we call it a day. I, I don't know. That remains to be seen. Those dice are still rolling, baby. <laughs> <laughs> at, at what point did you guys stop recording on tape and start going, you know, uh, straight digital? Ooh, we. Um, hmm. Uh, oh, wow, we. Uh, let's see. You're going to have to go. Uh... <laughs> 
golly, I don't know, sometime in the mid nineties, I think. And I couldn't okay. tell you the record. Um, I do remember going into uh, my friend, Joel Jaffe's studio, Studio D, and we were cutting something. Oh, it might've been for our Christmas acapella uh, giveaway, our cassette. And uh, one or the other, I can't remember, but uh, in any event, I said, what is this? You know, And he says, well, it's Pro Tools. And he gave me five, I sat there and watched him and he gave me a little five minute tutorial. And I said, holy Toledo, I got to get me one of these. It took me three days and it was in my studio and I, I only used tape for sort of a granular effect on certain occasions, but it was sometime around then. So yeah. That was uh, four chords. Was that uh, a, a straight, a straight to digital? At, I got the, I got our tape library in our, my mind and that was done on analog tape. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it's only fitting. Yeah, I know. You know, you want that warmth. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, they had a lot of guys, uh, um, what they do, um, it doesn't, these were studio secrets back then, but they don't mean a darn thing now. When they're cutting the basics to a tune, which a lot, most folks will know what that means. You just get the rhythm section down a scratch track. They would record them on a, analog tape, copy that over to another tape and put the original away until it came time to mix so that the tape was still fresh and still had all the high fidelity. Because when you roll over this tape 100, 200, 400 times trying to get vocals, horns, backing tracks, overdubs, all this stuff, the low end, the high end starts to diminish in the tape. So that was a little studio trick. I don't think a lot of people were aware of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. I'll tell you, uh, Gino in Illinois wants to know, mm -hmm. uh, what can your fans do to get you guys into the rock and roll hall of fame? Oh, well, could do like a certain presidential candidate I know and get on all of his fans to vote twice. <laughs> uh, that's a darn good question. Uh, petition the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, and that's the best you can do. I'm actually um, quite surprised we've never even been up for consideration. Um, you know, uh, considering you know Dolly Parton and ABBA are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, <laughs> some of them, you know. But I'll tell you. Dolly Parton uh, is a class act even to this very day to quietly say, you know, why me? I don't deserve this. I don't have a, I don't know a darn thing about rock and roll, but thank you very much. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's very, well, there, there's very, a few folks in there, Johnny, that you makes you you know, wonder why they don't just change the name of it to the music thank, hall of fame. Cause thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. You know, because because when you, when you look at the list, you know, and no disrespect to the people who are who are in in their, you know, uh, chosen field or sure. you know, style, what have you, they're top of the game. However, yeah. it's not rock and roll. That's right. So, so you want to think who's who's bringing these names up, and that's no slight on those people, but right, there seems to be something there that is uh i don't know missing is that a fair term skewed it, it, it makes you wonder yeah, yeah. thank you makes you, you wonder. Uh -huh. <laughs> very well put. But, yeah but uh <laughs> say if, if they would just change it to the to the you know music hall of fame or you know pop yeah. music hall of fame or whatever then then there'd be nobody questioning it. But there's a lot of people that sit there, scratch their heads going, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't there's know. There's all these people it. over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, boy. I don't know if you know this, but when that was happening, there were a few locations that came up at the time, trying to figure out where the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was going to be. Bill Graham fought tooth and nail to get it in San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, in hindsight, I think it ended up in the right place. Uh, I don't know what Bill was on about, bless his heart. Um, I had a lot of respect for the guy. But I am, uh, to this day, I'm surprised we haven't set up a, a 60s 
San Francisco Bay Area Summer of Love and Beyond um, Hall of Fame here. Uh, there was a there was a um, valiant attempt to do that here in Marin County where I live for a second, but uh, no one's picked that torch up and ran with it. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, Maybe I, I, I don't do understand. With all my spare time. Uh -huh. <laughs> sure. So, all my spare time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I'm surprised there's not a Bammy museum. That's that's a good way to put it, Bammy. Except that's uh, yeah. That's I mean, a, that's not what they call that's it. That's an owned, but yeah, that's an that's a trademark term. But I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. The area music museum. It, it would. Uh, it's. Uh, it, they're dying for it. It'd be like the Stax Museum mm -hmm. or anything else. Uh, along yeah. the same lines, uh, folks may or may not be aware of this place called the Record Plant that was uh, mm -hmm. started, I don't know, a guy named Gary Kelgren, I think, down in L.A. or New York, I think L.A. And eventually, the record he opened one up here in Sausalito, California. And everybody and their brother and sister recorded there. For Stevie Wonder... Uh, Sly, of course, I worked there with Sly and live broadcasts from the local radio station. Um, right now, somebody has just uh, taken control of the building, and I'm encouraging them to make it a um, a plant, record plant museum, as Stax did with Stax Museum in Memphis. I think it'd be a smash. <laughs> won't get an argument from me now tell me this johnny i know you know we, we in part two we talked about you know uh, recording soulsville in memphis and getting a chance to see a bunch of different stuff how many uh of the different music museums if you had a chance to to visit while you've been on the road or just you know for personal pleasure oh shoot well besides memphis of course which i got to about four or five um <clears throat> Uh, I think I went to Mu Muscle Shoals once um, uh, just to check it out. Uh, a buddy of mine has a, a really cool studio in Birmingham called Boutwell. And uh, it may not have cut all the classic hits we know and love, but Mark's studio has been around a long time. And um, golly, um, not going back that far, it was a, an honor and a pleasure to cut. Um, and mix mostly at the power station in New York, which uh, everyone recorded at. <clears throat> and uh, in the heat of sports, uh, you know, these uh, record companies want everything yesterday when a good idea comes up. So I forget what we were doing, whether we were on tour or working, but uh, they wanted um, to release If This Is It, I believe it was, as a single. And of course, Bob Claremont, Mar <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Clear Mountain is our man. Unfortunately, Bob was up at Bearsville cutting Chrissy Hind and the Pretenders. So uh, they're ready to throw anything at this thing. So we take the tape, they hire a helicopter, Huey and I jump in, fly up the Hudson River, land at Bearsville. Um, oh God, I forget the, the guy who owned it. Uh, at Clear Mountain and uh, and uh, this uh, the owner uh, greet us. We have lunch. We go in. Bob throws a mix on it. And we fly it back home, back to New York. <laughs> and Chrysalis got their uh, stereo mix. <laughs> that was a trip. <laughs> that that's dedication. And we, and we got to have lunch with Chrissy Hyde, one of my favorite female singers in the world on the planet. Is she married. What's a couple of. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what's a couple of your favorite pretenders tracks oh shoot back to ohio what's that tune called uh um yeah uh, uh something in pocket god i love that tune. brass in pocket brass in pocket uh you know i don't know titles um uh, chain gang back on the chain mm -hmm. gang oh i tell you song. what i Let's love yeah, I love Billy Bremner's guitar on Chain Gang. Oh man, it's fantastic! I mean, the, 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 I wish I the, that's the, what I wish I could do. <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah, the the tone on that. I mean, it is just yeah. so unique. 
Oh God, it's gorgeous, gorgeous. So there you go. Yeah, and she's too old. For, <laughs> she's too old for me, anyhow. So I'll dash. I'll dash that idea right now. <laughs> Well, hopefully she's watching, so she'll know to, to stay away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a babe magnet. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, Johnny, we, we got through uh, all of the, the viewer questions. Is there anything that uh, that we haven't uh, covered? That, it's been uh, pretty deep, or, or man. Missed, this, I is should our, say? this is pretty deep. This is our third meeting. Um, yeah. No dropouts. No foul How language. <laughs> I mean, they, we can use turd, can't we? Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, it's four letters, but it's but it's but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Rhymes with yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, Michael, thanks for having me, man. This was just really a blast. And uh, yeah, well, you're thanks great for to being work here with. again. You're really great to work with, man. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You bet. All right, everybody. We'll tell you what. I want to thank you for watching, Johnny. Again, thank you for being here. Everybody, have a good night. Good night. This has been Music Night at the Majestic with Michael Boswell. If you enjoyed this edition of Music Night at the Majestic, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and at musicnight.net. Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content without the express written consent of Starliner Media is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time for Music Night at the Majestic. This is your announcer speaking.